I'm speaking today with uh, Michelle Bamberger and uh, Robert Oswald uh, at their home. Uh, one of the things you may not realize about them from their paper is that they uh, have one disclosure uh, which you have to make, which is that they're uh, both married. Uh, and, uh, they both bring a different skill set uh, to the area of uh, discussing and investigating the health effects of uh, hydraulic fracturing. Uh, perhaps I should uh, ask you both in turn uh, what particular in your background uh, brings you to this area uh, in terms of skills. Okay, um, I'm Michelle Bamberger. I'm a, a veterinarian in private practice in New York and um, I became involved in this uh, originally uh, because I started hearing about animals uh, becoming ill um, and wondering uh, how they were being affected uh, by this process, if at all. And I felt that documentation uh, really needed to be done to see if there was some sort of connection or link uh, between their health uh, changes and um, the presence of uh, a hydraulic fracturing nearby. And you, Robert? Okay, I'm, I'm a faculty at the Cornell College of Veterinary Medicine. I've been interested in uh, central nervous system function and toxins and uh, drugs that interact with neurons, so um, this is actually very interesting in terms of toxic toxicological profile of some of these drugs and, and uh, its interaction with, with, um, with both the nervous system and the endocrine system. So um, one of the things that you've been doing is this essentially a descriptive epidemiology uh, of the health effects, but you've been using animals as sentinels uh, for uh, these health effects. Could you uh, describe to me why animals make uh, a good sentinel uh, to warn us uh, about the uh, health effects of well, hydraulic fracturing? Yeah, I, I, the one the one thing that I usually like to point out is that you can get even in a descriptive study you can get your numbers a bit higher. Uh, one example that we use often is that it's hard to find a uh, hundred pregnant women in the vicinity of one gas well. Whereas we can do that in veterinary medicine, we can get 100 pregnant cows in the vicinity of uh, one, one well. So, so in terms of just the sheer numbers, we can look at, uh, look at that. They're, they're also exposed continuously. They don't go off to work during the day. They're, they're in the area. They're outside. Um, they're, they don't really have any choice about what water they drink. They drink the water that's, that's uh, available to them. So, and their, you know, their reproductive rates are higher. It's just, it seems that you can see the problems in animals sometimes sooner than you may in humans. And uh, as a veterinarian uh, coming to this particular area, is there anything that uh, strikes you uh, about uh, the cases that you've seen? Uh, yes, uh, with both uh, production animals as well as small animals, uh, the big effect that we've seen with, with numbers affected is in reproduction. So seeing uh, a lot of uh, abortions and stillbirths uh, that for the farmers are, are unusual. Their, their rates of these things uh, before drilling started in their area are in the range of 1 to 5 percent usually. Uh, we look at after drilling uh, what they're seeing is they're up uh, 10 to as much as 50% in, in some cases. So uh, abortion, stillbirths, failure to breed, and failure to cycle. Again, we don't know definitively what is causing this, uh, but we do know it's happening. Uh, we do have that, that link. Uh, so much more investigation uh, needs to be done. And just would like to say as far as sentinels go, if we move from animals to people, uh, that we have seen uh, when we look at families that children are the ones to get sick uh, first, uh, and we feel that is because uh, of their higher metabolic rates, uh, their, their exposure rates are higher uh, for the reason of their metabolism, but also because they eat more per pound uh, of body weight uh, compared to adults. Um, so they're going to be more exposed to whatever is in the environment. So when you are visiting farms or animal owners, you're hearing stories both about the livestock or, or the domestic animals. Uh, and also uh, humans too. Right, we do. We, we started off with, with just animals but quickly realized that the owners were also being affected in, uh, by, uh, in, in many different ways. Uh, but the major things that we've come upon with people are um, headaches. Headaches are often reported. Uh, nosebleeds, uh, rashes, 
uh, gastrointestinal uh, symptoms of vomiting, diarrhea, and, and cramping. Uh, those things are, are really common. Now, there's a distinction here. Um, those symptoms that you're describing are things which are more instant after exposure, whereas reproductive changes take a, a longer period of time. Right. Um, do you have any thoughts that these may be uh, done by different mechanisms? Um, that, you know, that's a great question uh, because uh, uh, approximately 40% or so of the, of the chemicals that are known to be used in drilling and fracturing are, could potentially be endocrine disruptors. Mm -hmm. uh, that throws uh, us off a little bit because they, endocrine disruptors, of course, affect many different systems uh, of the body. So mm -hmm. um, that, you know, they could be in, in play uh, as well. And I just want to add that as far as people and reproduction, uh, because we're up over 35 cases now, we have several cases where uh, we're starting to see some unusual reproductive things. In other words, in uh, several cases, there are young girls who are, who are not cycling. Um, so in, in the family history and what they're reporting, this is an unusual uh, thing that's happening. Um, do you find, as a veterinarian, it's uh, different to talk to people? <laughs> um, well, I, I know because as a veterinarian, we're really uh, talking with people uh, most of the times. Of, of course, the animals aren't talking to us per se, except for their behavior. But we have to know how to deal with uh, clients and talk with people. And uh, it's a, the, what's unusual now for me is that I'm asking the people too uh, what their what their problems are. Uh, but they feel very comfortable in, in telling me these things because they've already told me about what's happening with their animals. They feel very. Uh, feel very comfortable uh, confiding their uh, physical symptoms as well. So uh, Robert, uh, what, what are, do you think are the barriers uh, that we have to understanding what are the particular toxins uh, that are involved and the pathways by which they might be affecting people in this industry? I, I mean there are a lot, of, a lot of different issues. One, we, we don't know all of the routes of exposure. Um, we, there hasn't been adequate testing. Uh, even when there is testing, we really don't understand uh, the levels of, of various chemicals that are that are important in terms of toxicology. We, we know now a lot about uh, dose response curves that are non-monotonic. The low dose effects could be as important or more important than high dose effects. So there, and 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 furthermore, we know almost nothing about combinations, combinations of, of toxicants in the environment and how, how they affect. So I think it's just really lack of information, basic information in toxicology that in this, you know, with respect to the chemicals that are being used. So we have the chemicals that are being used in the fracking operation, both in terms of uh, the drilling muds and also in terms of the uh, slick water, which is used in the hydraulic fracturing yeah. itself. And then we have the flow back in the produced waters, which right. are both a mixture of what's gone down, but also the, whatever has been leached out down underground, a mile underground. That's right. Uh, so um, in the absence of knowledge as to what those chemicals are, can we still do research on uh, the, the health effects of these uh, agents? Yeah, I think so. I mean, one of the things, I think one in any health outbreak, one of the most important things to do is serious epidemiology, and that mm -hmm. has been done to some extent, but not really very extensively on this issue. And I think one can do that, um, and we can get a better idea of, of where to look once we know that. I think case studies are important for getting some ideas of what to look at. You know, that's mm -hmm. a, that, has, that has case studies have a you know, important uh, role in the history of medicine for, for almost cool. any any uh, disease outbreak or whatever. But uh, epidemiology is also very important. I think once we know a little bit more about the prevalence of problems, we can learn, we can then delve into more specific issues in a more you know informed way. So um, you're visiting these people uh, down in Pennsylvania predominantly at the moment. Um, are there any things that they can do uh, for themselves uh, in order to prevent uh, these health effects? 
Um, well, uh, one of the things we tell them is to uh, try to stop using your water, and that can be really hard. Uh, buying water is expensive. Um, not sh taking showers at home, unfortunately, is another recommendation uh, if they don't have access to a water buffalo. Uh, but that's all, all going to decrease their exposure. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Some people have moved out. Uh, the air is so bad, uh, they, they find that they're much sicker living at home. Uh, they're, they have burning of the eyes, nose, and throat, and all many other symptoms that we talked about. Um, so we do, we do recommend that. I always tell them to get their animals off the water. Uh, they can oftentimes do that with their companion animals, but getting a herd of, of cows off or, or your horses off uh, is very difficult because of how much water those animals really need to uh, stay healthy. So uh, we do the basics uh, that we can with decreasing exposure, mm -hmm. but it, it becomes mm -hmm. very, very difficult if people want to stay on their property and continue living in their home. Mm -hmm. Um, both veterinary medicine and uh, the kind of science that you're doing at, at Cornell um, requires um, a particular approach uh, to those disciplines. In what way uh, is your background as an evidence-based professional and as a scientist uh, helpful uh, in what you're doing at the moment in terms of investigating this problem? Well, that's a good question. I mean, one of the things that we always try to do is, is you know, look at any statement we make and make sure it's get backed up by some evidence. Um, of course, it's orders of magnitude different from experimental science in the laboratory where you, you can hold one, you know, hold everything constant and change one variable and make some more definitive conclusions. Mm -hmm. So what we like to look for are cases where we can have experimental and control groups um, and do something that's a little bit more similar to experimental science. And, and one way to get at that per perhaps is looking at herds that are split into uh, two pastures, one pasture that has had mm -hmm. some exposure and one that hasn't. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, that's not a perfect experiment, but we're moving toward experimental science away from just observation when we can do that sort of thing. Good. Yeah. Um, Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>